28th degree, Knight of the Sun or Prince Adept Part 2, the Pythagorean ideas as to particular numbers are partially expressed in the following lecture of the Kabbalists. Why did you seek to be received a Knight of the Kabbalah? Ans. To know, by means of numbers, the admirable harmony which there is between nature and religion. How were you announced? Ans. By twelve raps. What do they signify? Ans. The twelve bases of our temporal and spiritual happiness. What is a Kabbalist? Ans. A man who has learned, by tradition, the sacerdotal art and the royal art. What means the device, omnia in numerous seat to sunt? Ans. That everything lies veiled in numbers. Explain me that. Ans. I will do so, as far as the number twelve. Your sagacity will discern the rest. What signifies the unit in the number ten? Ans. God, creating and animating matter, expressed by zero, which, alone, is of no value. What does the unit mean? Ans. In the moral order, a word incarnate in the bosom of a virgin or religion. In the physical, a spirit embodied in the virgin earth or nature. What do you mean by the number two? Ans. In the moral order, man and woman. In the fire icicle, the active and the passive. What do you mean by the number three? Ans. In the moral order, the three theological virtues. In the physical, the three principles of bodies. What do you mean by the number four? Ans. The four cardinal virtues. The four elementary qualities. What do you mean by the number five? Ans. The quintessence of religion. The quintessence of matter. What do you mean by the number six? Ans. The theological cube. The physical cube. What do you mean by the number seven? Ans. The seven sacraments. The seven planets. What do you mean by the number eight? Ans. The small number of Elas. The small number of wise men. What do you mean by the number nine? Ans. The exaltation of religion. The exaltation of matter. What do you mean by the number ten? Ans. The ten commandments. The ten precepts of nature. What do you mean by the number eleven? Ans. The multiplication of religion. The multiplication of nature. What do you mean by the number twelve? Ans. The twelve articles of faith, the twelve apostles, foundation of the holy city, who preach God throughout the whole world, for our happiness and spiritual joy. The twelve operations of nature, the twelve signs of the zodiac, foundation of the primum mobile extending it throughout the universe for our temporal felicity. Com of the Rabbi, president of the Sandy Dream, adds, from all that you have said, it results that the unit develops itself in two, is completed in three internally, and so produces four externally, whence, through six, seven, eight, nine, it arrives at five, half of the spherical number ten, to ascend, passing through eleven, to twelve, and to raise itself, by the number four times ten, to the number six times twelve, the final term and summit of our eternal happiness. What is the generative number? Ans. In the divinity, it is the unit, in created things, the number two, because the divinity, one, engenders two, and in created things two engenders one. What is the most majestic number? Ans. Three, because it denotes the triple divine essence. What is the most mysterious number? Ans. 4, because it contains all the mysteries of nature. What is the most occult number? Ans. 5, because it is enclosed in the center of the series. What is the most salutary number? Ans. 6, because it contains the source of our spiritual and corporeal happiness. What is the most fortunate number? Ans. 7 because it leads us to the decade, the perfect number. Which is the number most to be desired? Ans. 8, because he who possesses it, is of the number of the Elus and sages. Which is the most sublime number? Ans. 9, because by it religion and nature are exalted. 
which is the most perfect number. Ans. 10, because it includes unity, which created everything, and zero, symbol of matter and chaos, whence everything emerged. In its figures it comprehends the created and uncreated, the commencement and the end, power and force, life and annihilation. By the study of this number, we find the relations of all things, the power of the creator, the faculties of the creature, the alpha and omega of divine knowledge, which is the most multiplying number. Ans. 11, because with the possession of two units, we arrive at the multiplication of things, which is the most solid number. Ans. 12, because it is the foundation of our spiritual and temporal happiness which is the favorite number of religion and nature. Ans. 4 times 10, because it enables us, rejecting everything impure, eternally to enjoy the number 6 times 12, term and summit of our felicity. What is the meaning of the square? Ans. It is the symbol of the four elements contained in the triangle, or the emblem of the three chemical principles, these things united form absolute unity in the primal matter. What is the meaning of the center of the circumference? Ans. It signifies the universal spirit, vivifying center of nature. What do you mean by the quadrature of the circle? Ans. The investigation of the quadrature of the circle indicates the knowledge of the four vulgar elements, which are themselves composed of elementary spirits or chief principles, as the circle, the round, is composed of lines, which escape the sight and are seen only by the mind. What is the profoundest meaning of the figure 3? Ans. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From the action of these three results the triangle within the square, and from the seven angles, the decade or perfect number. Which is the most confused figure? Ans. Zero com are the emblem of chaos, formless mixture of the elements. What do the four devices of the degree signify? Ans. That we are to hear, see, be silent, and enjoy our happiness. The unit is the symbol of identity, equality, existence, conservation and general harmony, the central fire, the point within the circle. Two, or the duad, is the symbol of diversity, inequality, division, separation, and vicissitudes. The figure one signifies the living man a body standing upright, man being the only living being possessed of this faculty. Adding to it a head, we have the letter P, the sign of paternity, creative power, and with a further addition, R, signifying man in motion, going, ends, address. The duad is the origin of contrasts. It is the imperfect condition into which, according to the Pythagoreans, a being falls, when he detaches himself from the monad, or god. Spiritual beings, emanating from God, are enveloped in the duad, and therefore receive only illusory impressions. As formerly the number one designated harmony, order, or the good principle, the one and only God, expressed in Latin solus, whence the words sol, solil, symbol of this God, the number to express the contrary idea. That commenced the fatal knowledge of good and evil. Everything double full supposed to the single and sole reality, was expressed by the binary number. It expressed also that state of contrariety in which nature exists, where everything is double, night and day, light and darkness, cold and heat, wet and dry, health and sickness, error and truth, one and the other sex, etc. Hence the Romans dedicated the second month in the year to Pluto, the god of hell and the second day of that month to the manes of the dead. The number one, with the Chinese, signified unity, harmony order, the good principle, or God, two, disorder, duplicity, falsehood. That people, in the earlier stages, based their whole philosophical system on the two primary figures or lines, one straight and unbroken, and the other broken or divided into two, doubling which, by placing one under the other, and trebling by placing three under each other, they made the four symbols and eight gua, which referred to the natural elements, and the primary principles of all things, and served symbolically or scientifically to express them. Plato terms unity and duality the original elements of nature, 
and first principles of all existence, and the oldest sacred book of the Chinese says, the great first principle has produced two equations and differences, or primary rules of existence, but the two primary rules or two oppositions, namely yin and yang, or repose and motion, have produced four sign symbols, and the four symbols have produced the eight qua or further combinations. The interpretation of the Hermetic fables shows, among every ancient people, in their principal gods, first, one, the creating monad, then three, then three times three, three times nine, and three times twenty-seven. This triple progression has for its foundation the three ages of nature, the past, the present, and the future, or the three degrees of universal generation. Birth, life, death beginning, middle, end. The monad was male, because its action produces no change in itself, but only out of itself. It represented the creative principle. The duad, for a contrary reason, was female, ever changing by addition, subtraction, or multiplication. It represents matter capable of form. The union of the monad and duad produces the triad signifying the world formed by the creative principle out of matter. Pythagoras represented the world by the right-angled triangle, in which the squares of the two shortest sides are equal, added together, to the square of the longest one, as the world, as formed, is equal to the creative cause, and matter clothed with form. The ternary is the first of the unequal numbers. The triad, mysterious number, which plays so great a part in the traditions of Asia and the philosophy of Plato, image of the Supreme Being, includes in itself the properties of the first two numbers. It was, to the philosophers, the most excellent and favorite number, a mysterious type, revered by all antiquity, and consecrated in the mysteries, wherefore there are but three essential degrees among Masons, who venerate, in the triangle, the most august mystery that of the sacred triad, object of their homage and study. In geometry, a line cannot represent a body absolutely perfect. As little do two lines constitute a figure demonstratively perfect. But three lines form, by their junction, the triangle, or the first figure regularly perfect, and this is why it had served and still serves to characterize the Eternal, who, infinitely perfect in his nature, is, as universal creator, the first being, and consequently the first perfection. The quadrangle or square, perfect as it appears, being but the second perfection, can in no wise represent God, who is the first. It is to be noted that the name of God in Latin and French, Deus, Dieu, has for its initial the delta or Greek triangle. Such is the reason, among ancients and moderns, for the consecration of the triangle whose three sides are emblems of the three kingdoms, or nature, or God. In the center is the Hebrew Jod, the animating spirit of fire, the generative principle, represented by the letter G. Initial of the name of deity in the languages of the north, and the meaning whereof is generation. The first side of the triangle, offered to the study of the apprentice, is the mineral kingdom, symbolized by Tub. The second side, the subject of the meditations of the fellow craft, is the vegetable kingdom, symbolized by Sib. A near of corn. In this reign begins the generation of bodies, and this is why the letter G, in its radiance, is presented to the eyes of the adept. The third side, the study whereof is devoted to the animal kingdom, and completes the instruction of the master, is symbolized by Mac. Son of Butrefaction. The figure 3 symbolizes the earth. It is a figure of the terrestrial bodies. The 2, upper half of 3, symbolizes the vegetable world, the lower half being hidden from our sight. 3 also referred to harmony, friendship, peace, concord, and temperance, and was so highly esteemed among the Pythagoreans that they called it perfect harmony. 3, 4, 10, and 12 were sacred numbers among the Etrurians as they were among the Jews, Egyptians, and Hindus. The name of deity, in many nations, consisted of three letters among the Greeks, I, A, Q, among the Persians, H, O, M, 
Among the Hindus, Om. Among the Scandinavians, I. O. W. On the upright tablet of the king, discovered at Nimrod, no less than five of the thirteen names of the great gods consist of three letters each comma nu, san, yav, ba, and bet. The quaternary is the most perfect number, and the root of other numbers, and of all things. The tetrad expresses the first mathematical power. Four represents also the generative power, from which all combinations are derived. The initiates considered it the emblem of movement and the infinite, representing everything that is neither corporeal nor sensible. Pythagoras communicated it to his disciples as a symbol of the eternal and creative principle, under the name of Quaternary, the ineffable name of God, which signifies source of everything that has received existence, and which, in Hebrew, is composed of four letters. In the Quaternary we find the first solid figure, the universal symbol of immortality, the pyramid. The Gnostics claimed that the whole edifice of their science rested on a square whose angles were silence, profundity, intelligence, and truth. For if the triangle, figured by the number three, forms the triangular base of the pyramid, it is unity which forms its point or summit. Lysias and Timaeus of Locria said that not a single thing could be named, which did not depend on the quaternary as its root. There is, according to the Pythagoreans, a connection between the gods and numbers, which constitutes the kind of divination called arithmomancy. The soul is a number, it is moved of itself, it contains in itself the quaternary number. Matter being represented by the number nine, or three times three, and the immortal spirit having for its essential hieroglyphic the quaternary or the number four, the sages said that man, having gone astray and become entangled in an inextricable labyrinth, in going from four to nine, the only way which he could take to emerge from these deceitful paths, these disastrous detours, and the abyss of evil into which he had plunged, was to retrace his steps, and go from nine to four. The ingenious and mystical idea which caused the triangle to be venerated, was applied to the figure four, four. It was said that it expressed a living being, I, bearer of the triangle, the emblem of God, I. E. Man bearing with himself a divine principle. 4 was a divine number, it referred to the deity, and many ancient nations gave God a name of four letters, as the Hebrews, the Egyptians Amun, the Persians Sura, the Greeks, and the Latins Deus. This was the tetragrammaton of the Hebrews, and the Pythagoreans called it tetracts, and swore their most solemn oath by it. So to Odin among the Scandinavians, is among the Greeks, Phta among the Egyptians, Thoth among the Phoenicians, and Azernebo among the Assyrians. The list might be indefinitely extended. The number five was considered as mysterious, because it was compounded of the binary, symbol of the false and double, and the ternary, so interesting in its results. It thus energetically expresses the state of imperfection, of order and disorder, of happiness and misfortune of life and death, which we see upon the earth. To the mysterious societies it offered the fearful image of the bad principle, bringing trouble into the inferior order comma in a word, the binary acting in the ternary. Under another aspect it was the emblem of marriage, because it is composed of two, the first equal number, and of three, the first unequal number. Wherefore Juno, the goddess of marriage, had for her hieroglyphic the number five, Moreover, it has one of the properties of the number nine, that of reproducing itself, when multiplied by itself, there being always a five on the right hand of the product, a result which led to its use as a symbol of material changes. The ancients represented the world by the number five. A reason for it, given by Diodorus, is, that it represents earth, water, a fire, and ether or spirit. Thence the origin of, five, and the universe, as the whole. The number five designated the universal quintessence, and symbolized, by its form the vital essence, the animating spirit which flows, serpent art, through all nature. In fact, this ingenious figure is the union of the two Greek accents apostrophe, placed over those vowels which ought to be or ought not to be aspirated.
The first sign apostrophe bears the name of potent spirit, and signifies the superior spirit, the spirit of God aspirated, spiratus, respired by man. The second sign apostrophe is styled mild spirit, and represents the secondary spirit, the spirit purely human. The triple triangle, a figure of five lines uniting in five points, was among the Pythagoreans an emblem of health. It is the pentatha of Pythagoras, or pentangle of Solomon, has five lines and five angles, and is, among masons, the outline or origin of the five-pointed star, and an emblem of fellowship. The number six was, in the ancient mysteries, a striking emblem of nature, as presenting the six dimensions of all bodies, the six lines which make up their form, viz. The four lines of direction, toward the north, south, east, and west, with the two lines of height and depth, responding to the zenith and nadir. The sages applied the similary to the physical man, while the septenary was, for them, the symbol of his immortal spirit. The hieroglyphical scenery, the double equilateral triangle, the symbol of deity. Six is also an emblem of health, and the symbol of justic, because it is the first perfect number, that is, the first whose aliquot parts, one slash two, one slash three, one slash six, or three, two, and one, added together, make itself. Ormitzd created six good spirits, and Ariman six evil ones. These typify the six summer and the six winter months. No number has ever been so universally in repute as the septenary. Its celebrity is due, no doubt, to the planets being seven in number. It belongs also to sacred things. The Pythagoreans regarded it as formed of the numbers three and four, the first whereof was, in their eyes, the image of the three material elements and the second the principle of everything that is neither corporeal nor sensible. It presented them, from that point of view, the emblem of everything that is perfect. Considered as composed of six and unity, it serves to designate the invisible center or soul of everything, because no body exists, of which six lines do not constitute the form, nor without a seventh interior point, as the center and reality of the body where the external dimensions give only the appearance. The numerous applications of the septenary confirmed the ancient sages in the use of this symbol. Moreover, they exalted the properties of the number seven, as having, in a subordinate manner, the perfection of the unit, for if the unit is uncreated, if no number produces it, the seven is also not engendered by any number contained in the interval between one and ten. The number four occupies an arithmetical middle ground between the unit and seven, inasmuch as it is as much over one, as it is under seven, the difference each way being three. The number seven, among the Egyptians, symbolized life, and this is why the letter Z of the Greeks was the initial of the verb I live, and Jupiter, father of life. The number eight, or the octary, is composed of the sacred numbers three and five. Of the heavens, of the seven planets, and of the sphere of the fixed stars, or of the eternal unity and the mysterious number seven, is composed the Ogdo Aid. The number eight, the first cube of equal numbers, regarded as sacred in the arithmetical philosophy. The Gnostic Ogdo Aid had eight stars, which represented the eight Kabiri of Samothrace, the eight Egyptian and Phoenician principles, the eight gods of Xenocrates, the eight angles of the cubic stone. The number eight symbolizes perfection, and its figure, eight or, infinity, indicates the perpetual and regular course of the universe. It is the first cube, two times to x two, and signifies friendship, prudence, counsel, and justice. It was a symbol of the primeval law which regarded all men as equal. The novary, or triple ternary. If the number three was celebrated among the ancient sages, that of three times three had no less celebrity, because, according to them, each of the three elements which constitute our bodies is ternary, the water containing earth and fire, the earth containing igneous and aqueous particles, and the fire being tempered by globules of water terrestrial corpuscles which serve to feed it. No one of the three elements being entirely separated from the others, all material beings composed of these three elements 
whereof each is triple, may be designated by the figurative number of three times three, which has become the symbol of all formations of bodies. Hence the name of ninth envelope, given to matter. Every material extension, every circular line, has for representative sign the number nine, among the Pythagoreans, who had observed the property which this number possesses, of reproducing itself incessantly and entire, in every multiplication, thus offering to the mind a very striking emblem of matter which is incessantly composed before our eyes, after having undergone a thousand decompositions. The number nine was consecrated to the spheres and the muses. It is the sign of every circumference, because a circle of 360 degrees is equal to 9, that is to say, 3 plus 6 plus 0 equals 9. Nevertheless, the ancients regarded this number with a sort of terror, they considered it a bad presage, as the symbol of versatility, of change and the emblem of the frailty of human affairs. Wherefore they avoided all numbers where 9 appears, and chiefly 81, the product of 9 multiplied by itself and the addition whereof, 8 plus 1, again presents the number 9. As the figure of the number 6 was the symbol of the terrestrial globe, animated by a divine spirit, the figure of the number 9 symbolized the earth, under the influence of the evil principle thence the terror it inspired. Nevertheless, according to Kabbalists, the figure 9 symbolizes the generative egg, or the image of a little globular being from whose lower side seems to flow its spirit of life. The aned, signifying an aggregate of nine things or persons, is the first square of unequal numbers. Everyone is aware of the singular properties of the number nine, which, multiplied by itself or any other number whatever, gives a result whose final sum is always nine, or always divisible by nine. Nine, multiplied by each of the ordinary numbers produces an arithmetical progression, each member whereof, composed of two figures, presents a remarkable fact, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81. 90 The first line of figures gives the regular series, from 1 to 10. The second reproduces this line doubly, first ascending, from the first figure of 18, and then returning from the second figure of 81. It follows, from the curious fact, that the half of the numbers which compose this progression represents, in inverse order, the figures of the second half, 9, 18, 27. 36. 45 equals 135 equals 9. And 1 plus 3 plus 5 equals 45 equals 990. 81. 72. 63. 54 equals 360 equals 9 dash 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 99 99 99 99 99 495 equals 18 equals 9. So 9 2 equals 81. 81 2 equals 6561 equals 18 equals 9. 9 times 2 equals 18. 18 2 equals 324 equals 9. 9 times 3 equals 27. 27 2 equals 729 equals 18 equals. 9 9 times 4 equals 36. 36 2 equals 1296 equals 18 equals 9. And so with every multiple of 9 say 45, 54, 63, 72, etc. Thus 9 times 8 equals 72. 72 2 equals 5184 equals 18 equals 9. And further, 
1827-3670-1827-3672-144 equals 9189 equals 18 equals 9216 equals 9144 equals 918 equals 954 equals 9108 equals 9504 equals 9 dash 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 324 equals 9 18 equals 9 729 equals 18 equals 9 1296 equals 18 equals 9 5184 equals 18 equals 9 108 108 dash 864 equals 18 108 equals 9 dash 11664 equals 18 equals 9 and so the cubes 27 2 equals 729 times 729 equals 18 equals 9 18 2 equals 324 equals 9 9 2 equals 81 81 2 equals 6561 equals 18 equals 9 729 3 2 4 6 5 6 1 6 561 equals 18 equals 9 1200 196 equals 18 equals 9 6561 equals 18 equals 9 1458 equals 18 equals 9 648 equals 18 equals 9 39366 equals 27 equals 9 5103 equals 9 972 equals 18 equals 9 32000 805 equals 18 equals 9 39366 equals 27 equals 9 531441 equals 18 equals 9 104976 equals 27 equals 9 43 million and 46721 equals 27 equals 9 the number 10 or the deanery is the measure of everything and reduces multiplied numbers to unity, containing all the numerical and harmonic relations, and all the properties of numbers which precede it, it concludes the abacus or table Pythagoras. To the mysterious societies, this number typified the assemblage of all the wonders of the universe. They wrote it thus, theta, that is to say, unity in the middle of zero, as the center of a circle, or symbol of deity. They saw in this figure everything that should lead to reflection. The center, the ray, and the circumference, represented to them God, man, and the universe. This number was, among the sages, a sign of concord, love, and peace. To Masons it is a sign of union and good faith, because it is expressed by joining two hands, or the master's grip, when the number of fingers gives ten, and it was represented by the tetracts of Pythagoras. The number 12, like the number 7, is celebrated in the worship of nature. The two most famous divisions of the heavens, that by 7, which is that of the planets, and that by 12, which is that of the signs of the zodiac, are found upon the religious monuments of all the peoples of the ancient world, even to the remote extremes of the east. Although Pythagoras does not speak the number 12, it is nonetheless a sacred number. It is image of the zodiac, and consequently that of the sun, which rules over it. Such are the ancient ideas in regard to those numbers which so often appear in masonry, and rightly understood, as the old sages understood them, they contain many a pregnant lesson. Before we enter upon the final lesson of Masonic philosophy, we will delay a few moments to repeat to you the Christian interpretations of the blue degrees. In the first degree, they said, there are three symbols to be applied. First, man, after the fall, was left naked and defenseless against the just anger of the deity. Prone to evil, the human race staggered blindly onward into the thick darkness of unbelief, bound fast by the strong cable toe of the natural and sinful will. Moral corruption was followed by physical misery. Want and destitution invaded the earth. War and famine and pestilence filled up the measure of evil, 
and over the sharp flints of misfortune and wretchedness man toiled with naked and bleeding feet. This condition of blindness, destitution, misery, and bondage, from which to save the world the Redeemer came, is symbolized by the condition of the candidate, when he is brought up for the first time to the door of the lodge. To D. Notwithstanding the death of the Redeemer, man can be saved only by faith, repentance, and reformation. To repent, he must feel the sharp sting of conscience and remorse, like a sword piercing his bosom. His confidence in his guide, whom he is told to follow and fear no danger, his trust in God, which he is caused to profess, and the point of the sword that is pressed against his naked left breast over the heart, are symbolical of the faith repentance and reformation necessary to bring him to the light of a life in Christ the Crucified. 3d. Having repented and reformed, and bound himself to the service of God by a firm promise and obligation, the light of Christian hope shines down into the darkness of the heart of the humble penitent, and blazes upon his pathway to heaven. And this is symbolized by the candidates being brought to light, after he is obligated, by the worshipful master who in that is a symbol of the Redeemer, and so brings him to light, with the help of the brethren, as he taught the word with the aid of the apostles. In the second degree there are two symbols, fourth. The Christian assumes new duties toward God and his fellows. Toward God, of love, gratitude, and veneration, and an anxious desire to serve and glorify him, towards his fellows, of kindness, sympathy, and justice and this assumption of duty this entering upon good works, is symbolized by the fellow craft's obligation, by which, bound as an apprentice to secrecy merely, and set in the northeast corner of the lodge, he descends as a fellow craft into the body of the brethren, and assumes the active duties of a good mason. 5. The Christian, reconciled to God, sees the world in a new light. This great universe is no longer a mere machine wound up and set going six thousand or sixty millions years ago, and left to run on afterward forever, by virtue of a law of mechanics created at the beginning, without further care or consideration on the part of a deity, but it has now become to him a great emanation from God, the product of his thought, not a mere dead machine, but a thing of life, over which God watches continually and every movement of which is immediately produced by his present action, the law of harmony being the essence of the deity, reenacted every instant. And this is symbolized by the imperfect instruction given in the fellow craft's degree, in the sciences, and particularly geometry, connected as the latter is with God himself in the mind of a mason, because the same letter, suspended in the east, represents both, and astronomy or the knowledge of the laws of motion and harmony that govern the spheres, is but a portion of the wider science of geometry. It is so symbolized, because it is here, in the second degree, that the candidate first receives another than moral instruction. There are also two symbols in the third degree, which, with the three in the first, and two in the second, make the seven. Sixth. The candidate after passing through the first part of the ceremony, imagines himself a master, and is surprised to be informed that as yet he is not, and that it is uncertain whether he ever will be. He is told of a difficult and dangerous path yet to be travelled, and is advised that upon that journey it depends whether he will become a master. This is symbolical of that which our Saviour said to Nicodemus, that, notwithstanding his morals might be beyond reproach, he could not enter the kingdom of heaven unless he were born again, symbolically dying, and again entering the world regenerate, like a spotless infant. 7. The murder of Hiram, his burial, and his being raised again by the Master, are symbols, both of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Redeemer, and of the death and burial and sins of the natural man, and his being raised again to a new life, or born again by the direct action of the Redeemer, after morality, symbolized by the entered apprentice's grip, and philosophy, symbolized by the grip of the fellow craft, had failed to raise him. That of the Lion of the House of Judah is the strong grip, never to be broken, with which Christ, of the royal line of that house, has clasped to himself the whole human race, 
and embraces them in his wide arms as closely and affectionately as brethren embrace each other on the five points of fellowship. As entered apprentices and fellow crafts, masons are taught to imitate the laudable example of those masons who labored at the building of King Solomon's temple, and to plant firmly and deep in their hearts those foundation stones of principle, truth, justice, temperance, fortitude, prudence, and charity, on which to erect that Christian character which all the storms of misfortune and all the powers and temptations of hell shall not prevail against those feelings and noble affections which are the most proper homage that can be paid to the grand architect and great father of the universe, and which make the heart a living temple builded to him, when the unruly passions are made to submit to rule and measurement, and their excesses are struck off with the gavel of self-restraint, and when every action and every principle is accurately corrected and adjusted by the square of wisdom, the level of humility, and the plumb of justice. The two columns, Juchen and Boaz, are the symbols of that profound faith and implicit trust in God and the Redeemer that are the Christian strength, and of those good works by which alone that faith can be established and made operative and effectual to salvation. The three pillars that support the lodge are symbols of a Christian's hope in a future state of happiness, faith in the promises and the divine character and mission of the Redeemer, and charitable judgment of other men. The three murderers of Kiam symbolize Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas the high priest, and Judas Iscariot, and the three blows given him are the betrayal by the last, the refusal of Roman protection by Pilate, and the condemnation by the high priest. They also symbolize the blow on the ear, the scourging, and the crown of thorns. The twelve fellow crafts sent in search of the body are the twelve disciples, in doubt whether to believe that the Redeemer would rise from the dead. The Master's word, supposed to be lost, symbolizes the Christian faith and religion, supposed to have been crushed and destroyed when the Saviour was crucified, after Iscariot had betrayed him, and Peter deserted him, and when the other disciples doubted whether he would arise from the dead but which rose from his tomb and flowed rapidly over the civilized world, and so that which was supposed to be lost was found. It symbolizes also the Saviour himself, the Word that was in the beginning that was with God, and that was God, the Word of life, that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and was supposed to be lost, while he lay in the tomb, for three days, and his disciples as yet knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead, and doubted when they heard of it and were amazed and frightened and still doubted when he appeared among them. The bush of acacia placed at the head of the grave of Kiam is an emblem of resurrection and immortality. Such are the explanations of our Christian brethren, entitled, like those of all other Masons, to a respectful consideration. Closing Instruction There is no pretense to infallibility in Masonry. It is not for us to dictate to any man what he shall believe. We have hitherto in the instruction of the several degrees, confined ourselves to and before you the great thoughts that have found expression in the different ages of the world, leaving you to decide for yourself as to the orthodoxy or heterodoxy of each, and what proportion of truth, if any, each contained. We shall pursue no other course in this closing philosophical instruction, in which we propose to deal with the highest questions that have ever exercised the human mind, comma, with the existence and the nature of a God, with the existence and the nature of the human soul, and with the relations of the divine and human spirit with the merely material universe. There can be no questions more important to an intelligent being, none that have for him a more direct and personal interest, and to this last word of Scottish masonry we invite your serious and attentive consideration. And, as what we shall now say will be but the completion and rounding off of what we have already said in several of the preceding degrees, in regard to the old thought and the ancient philosophies, we hope that you have noted and not forgotten our previous lessons, without which this would seem imperfect and fragmentary. In its idea of rewarding a faithful and intelligent workman by conferring upon him a knowledge of the true word, masonry has perpetuated a very great truth because it involves the proposition that the idea which a man forms of God is always the most important element in his speculative theory of the universe, and in his particular practical plan of action for the church, the state, 
the community, the family, and his own individual life. It will ever make a vast difference in the conduct of a people in war or peace, whether they believe the supreme God to be a cruel deity, delighting in sacrifice and blood, or a God of love, and an individual's speculative theory as to the mode and extent of God's government, and as to the nature and reality of his own free will and consequent responsibility, will needs, have great influence in shaping the course of his life and conversation. We see every day the vast influence of the popular idea of God. All the great historical civilizations of the race have grown out of the national ideas which were formed of God, or have been intimately connected with those ideas. The popular theology, which at first is only an abstract idea in the heads of philosophers, by and by shows itself in the laws, and in the punishments for crime, in the churches, the ceremonies and the sacraments the festivals and the fasts, the weddings, the baptisms and the funerals, in the hospitals, the colleges, the schools, and all the social charities, in the relations of husband and wife, parent and child, in the daily work and the daily prayer of every man. As the world grows in its development, it necessarily outgrows its ancient ideas of God, which were only temporary and provisional. A man who has a higher conception of God than those about him, and who denies that their conception is God, is very likely to be called an atheist by men who are really far less believers in a God than he. Thus the Christians, who said the heathen idols were no gods, were accounted atheists by the people, and accordingly put to death, and Jesus of Nazareth was crucified as an unbelieving blasphemer, by the Jews. There is a mere formal atheism which is a denial of God in terms, but not in reality. A man says, there is no God, that is, no God that is self-originated, or that never originated, but always was and had been, who is the cause of existence, who is the mind and the providence of the universe, and so the order, beauty, and harmony of the world of matter and mind do not indicate any plan or purpose of deity. But, he says, nature comma meaning by that the whole sum total of existence comma that is powerful, active, wise, and good, nature is self-originated, or always was and had been, the cause of its own existence, the mind of the universe and the providence of itself. There is obviously a plan and purpose whereby order, beauty, and harmony are brought about, but all that is the plan and purpose of nature. In such cases, the absolute denial of God is only formal and not real. The qualities of God are admitted, and deemed to be real, and it is a mere change of name to call the possessor of those qualities, nature, and not God. The real question is, whether such qualities exist, as we call God, and not, by what particular name we shall designate the qualities. One man may call the sum total of these qualities, nature, another, heaven, a third, universe, a fourth, matter, a fifth, spirit, a sixth, God, Theos, Zeus, Alpha Deer, Allah, or what he pleases. All admit the existence of the being, power, or ends, thus diversely named. The name is of the smallest consequence. Real atheism is the denial of the existence of any God, of the actuality of all possible ideas of God. It denies that there any mind, intelligence, or ends, that is the cause and providence of the universe, and of anything or any existence, soul, spirit, or being, that intentionally or intelligently produces the order, beauty, and harmony thereof, and the constant and regular modes of operation therein. It must necessarily deny that there is any law, order, or harmony in existence, or any constant mode of operation in the world, for it is utterly impossible for any human creature to conceive however much he may pretend to do so, of either of these, except as a consequence of the action of intelligence, which is, indeed, that otherwise unknown thing, the existence of which these alone prove, otherwise than as the cause of these, not a thing at all, a mere name for the wholly uncognizable cause of these. The real atheist must deny the existence of the qualities of God, deny that there is any mind of awe in the universe any self-conscious providence, any providence at all. He must deny that there is any being or cause of finite things, that is self-consciously powerful, wise, 
just, loving, and faithful to itself and its own nature. He must deny that there is any plan in the universe or any part of it. He must hold, either that matter is eternal, or that it originated itself, which is absurd, or that it was originated by an intelligence, or at least by a cause, and then he admits a God. No doubt it is beyond the reach of our faculties to imagine how matter originated, how it began to be, in space where before was nothing, or God only. But it is equally beyond the reach of our faculties to imagine it eternal and unoriginated. To hold it to be eternal, without thought or will, that the specific forms of it, the seed, the rock, the tree, the man, the solar system, all came with no forethought planning or producing them, by chance or the fortuitous concourse of atoms, of matter that has no thought or will, and that they indicate no mind, no plan, no purpose, no providence, is absurd. It is not to deny the existence of what we understand by mind, plan, purpose, providence, but to insist that these words shall have some other meaning than that which the human race has ever attached to them, shall mean some unknown thing, for which the human race has no name because it has of such a thing no possible idea. Either there never was any such thing as a plan, and the word is nonsense, or the universe exists in conformity to a plan. The word never meant, and never can mean, any other thing than that which the universe exhibits. So with the word purpose, so with the word providence. They mean nothing, or else only what the universe proves. It was soon found that the denial of a conscious power, the cause of man and of his life, of a providence, or a mind and intelligence arranging man in reference to the world, and the world in reference to man, would not satisfy the instinctive desires of human nature, or account for the facts of material nature. It did not long answer to say, if it ever was said, that the universe was drifting in the void inane, and neither it, nor any mind within nor without it knew of its whence, its whither, or its whereabouts, that man was drifting in the universe, knowing little of his whereabouts, nothing of his whence or whither, that there was no mind, no providence, no power, that knew any better, nothing that guided and directed man in his drifting, or the universe in the weltering waste of time. To say to man and woman, your heroism, your bravery, your self-denial all comes to nothing, your nobleness will do no good you will die, and your nobleness will do mankind no service, for there is no plan or order in all these things, everything comes and goes by the fortuitous concourse of atoms, did not, nor ever will, long satisfy the human mind. True, the theory of atheism has been uttered. It has been said, death is the end. This is a world without a god, you are a body without a soul, there is a here but no hereafter for you, earth, but no heaven. Die, and return to your dust. Man is bones, blood, bowels, and brain, mind is matter, there is no soul in the brain, nothing but nerves. We can see all the way to a little star in the nebula of Orion's belt, so distant that it will take light a thousand millions of years to come from it to THC earth, journeying at the rate of twelve millions of miles a minute. There is no heaven this side of that, you see all the way through, there is not a speck of heaven, and do you think there is any beyond it, and if so, when would you reach it? There is no providence. Nature is a fortuitous concourse of atoms, though it is a fortuitous function of matter, a fortuitous result of a fortuitous result, a chance a shot from the great wind gun of the universe, accidentally loaded, pointed at random, and fired off by chance things happen. They are not arranged. There is luck, and there is ill luck, but there is no providence. Die you into dust, does all this satisfy the human instinct of immortality, that makes us ever long, with unutterable longing, to join ourselves again to our dear ones who have gone away before us, and to mankind, for eternal life? Does it satisfy our mighty hungering and thirst for immortality, our anxious longing to come nearer to? and to know more of, the eternal cause of all things? Men never could be content to believe that there was no mind that thought for man, no conscience to enact eternal laws, no here to love those whom nothing of earth loves or cares for, 
no will of the universe to marshal the nations in the way of wisdom, justice and love. History is not thank God. We know it is not comma the fortuitous concourse of events, or nature that of atoms. We cannot believe that there is no plan nor purpose in nature, to Gdau going out and coming in, that there is a mighty going, but goes nowhere, that all beauty, wisdom, affection, justice, morality in the world, is an accident, and may end tomorrow. All over the world there is heroism unrequited, or paid with misery, vice on thrones, corruption in high places, nobleness in poverty or even in chains, the gentle devotion of woman rewarded by brutal neglect or more brutal abuse and violence, everywhere want, misery, overwork, and under wages. Add to these the atheist's creed a body without a soul, an earth without heaven, a world without a god, and what a pandemonium would we make of this world? The intellect of the atheist would find matter everywhere, but no causing and providing mind. His moral sense would find no equitable will, no beauty of moral excellence, no conscience enacting justice into the unchanging law of right, no spiritual order or spiritual providence, but only material fate and chance. His affections would find only finite things to love, and to them the dead who were loved and who died yesterday, are like the rainbow that yesterday evening lived a moment and then passed away. His soul, flying through the vast inane, and feeling the darkness with its wings, seeking the soul of all, which at once is reason, conscience, and the heart of all that is, would find no God, but a universe all disorder, no infinite, no reason, no conscience, no heart no soul of things, nothing to reverence, to esteem, to love, to worship, to trust in, but only an ugly force, alien and foreign to us, that strikes down those we love, and makes us mere worms on the hot sand of the world. No voice would speak from the earth to comfort him. It is a cruel mother, that great earth, that devours her young commie force and nothing more. Out of the sky would smile no kind providence in all its thousand starry eyes, and in storms a malignant violence, with its lightning sword, would stab into the darkness, seeking for men to murder. No man ever was or ever can be content with that. The evidence of God has been ploughed into nature so deeply, and so deeply woven into the texture of the human soul, that atheism has never become a faith, though it has sometimes assumed the shape of theory. Religion is natural to man. Instinctively he turns to God and reverences and relies on him. In the mathematics of the heavens, written in gorgeous diagrams of fire, he sees law, order, beauty, harmony without end, in the ethics of the little nations that inhabit the ant hills he sees the same, in all nature, animate and inanimate, he sees the evidences of a design, a will, an intelligence, and a God comma of a God beneficent and loving as well as wise, and merciful and indulgent as well as powerful. To man, surrounded by the material universe, and conscious of the influence that his material environments exercised upon his fortunes and his present destiny semicolon to man, ever confronted with the splendors of the starry heavens, the regular march of the seasons, the phenomena of sunrise and moonrise, and all evidences of intelligence and design that everywhere press upon and overwhelmed him. All imaginable questions as to the nature and cause of these phenomena constantly recurred, demanding to be solved, and refusing to be sent away unanswered. And still, after the lapse of ages, press upon the human minutes and demand solution, the same great questions perhaps still demanding it in vain. Advancing to the period when man had ceased to look upon the separate parts and individual forces of the universe as gods, when he had come to look upon it as a whole, this question, among the earliest, occurred to him, and insisted on being answered, is this material universe self-existent, or was it created? Is it eternal, or did it originate? And then in succession came crowding on the human mind these other questions, is this material universe a mere aggregate of fortuitous combinations of matter, or is it the result and work of intelligence acting upon a plan? If there be such an intelligence, what and where is it? Is material universe itself an intelligent being? Is it like man, body and a soul? Does nature act upon itself?
or is there a cause beyond it that acts upon it? If there is a personal God, separate from the material universe, that created all things, himself uncreated, is he corporeal or incorporeal, material or spiritual, the soul of the universe or wholly apart from it? And if he be spirit, what then is spirit? Was that supreme deity active or quiescent before the creation, and if quiescent during a previous eternity, what necess of his nature moved him at last to create a world, or was it a mere whim that had no motive? Was matter coexistent with him, or absolutely created him out of nothing? Did he create it, or only mold and shape and fashion a chaos already existing, coexistent with himself? Did the deity directly create matter? or was creation the work of inferior deities, emanations from himself? If he be good and just, whence comes it that, for knowing everything, he has allowed sorrow and evil to exist, and how to reconcile with his benevolence and wisdom the prosperity of vice and the misfortunes of virtue in this world? And then, as to man himself, recurred these other questions, as they continue to recur to all of us, what is it in us that thinks? Is thought the mere result of material organization, or is there in us a soul that thinks, separate from and resident in the body? If the latter, is it eternal and uncreated, and if not, how created? Is it distinct from God, or an emanation from Him? Is it inherently immortal, or only so by destination, because God has willed it? Is it to return to and be merged in Him, or ever to exist, separately from Him? with its present identity? If God has foreseen and forearranged all that occurs, how has man any real free will, or the least control over circumstances? How can anything be done against the will of infinite omnipotence, and if all is done according to that will, how is there any wrong or evil, in what infinite wisdom and infinite power does not choose to prevent? What is the foundation of the moral law? Did God enact it of his own mere pleasure? and if so, can he not, when he pleases, repeal it? Who shall assure us he will not repeal it, and make right wrong, and virtue vice? Or is the moral law a necessity of his nature, and if so, who enacted it, and does not that assert a power, like the old necessity, superior to deity? And, close following after these, came the great question of hereafter, of another life, of the soul's destiny, and the thousand other collateral and subordinate questions, as to matter, spirit, futurity, and God, that have produced all the systems of philosophy, all metaphysics, and all theology, since the world began. What the old philosophic mind thought upon these great questions, we have already, to some extent, developed. With the emanation doctrine of the Gnostics and the Orient, we have endeavored to make you familiar. We have brought you face to face with the Kabbalists, the Essens, and Philo the Jew. We have shown that, and how, much of the old mythology was derived from the daily and yearly recurring phenomena of the heavens. We have exhibited to you the ancient notions by which they endeavored to explain to themselves the existence and prevalence of evil, and we have in some degree made known to you their metaphysical ideas as to the nature of the deity. Much more remains to be done than it is within our power to do. We stand upon the sounding shore of the great ocean of time. In front of us stretches out the heaving waste of the illimitable past, and its waves, as they roll up to our feet along the sparking slope of the yellow sands, bring to us, and W and then, from the depths of that boundless ocean, a shell, a few specimens of algae torn rudely from their stones, a rounded pebble, and that is all of all the vast treasures of ancient thought that lie buried there, with the mighty anthem of the boundless ocean thundering over them forever and forever. Let us once more, and for the last time, along the shore of that great ocean, gather a few more relics of the past, and listen to its mighty voices, as they come, in fragmentary music, in broken and interrupted rhythm, whispering to us from the great bosom of the past. Rites, creeds, and legends express, directly or symbolically, some leading idea, according to which the mysteries of being are supposed to be explained in deity. The intricacies of mythical genealogies are a practical acknowledgement of the mysterious nature of the omnipotent deity, 
displaying in their beautiful but ineffectual imagery the first efforts of the mind to communicate with nature, the flowers which fancy strewed before the youthful steps of Psyche, when she first set out in pursuit of the immortal object of her love. Theories and notions, in all their varieties of truth and falsehood, are a machinery more or less efficacious, directed to the same end. Every religion was, in its origin, an embryo philosophy, or an attempt to interpret the unknown by mind, and it was only when philosophy, which is essentially progress, outgrew its first acquisitions, that religion became a thing apart, cherishing as unalterable dogmas the notions which philosophy had abandoned. Separated from philosophy, it became arrogant and fantastical, professing to have already attained what its more authentic representative was ever pursuing in vain, and discovering, through its initiations and mysteries, all that to its contracted view seemed wanting to restore the well-being of mankind, the means of purification and expiation, remedies for disease, expedients to cure the disorders of the soul, and to propitiate the gods. Why should we attempt to confine the idea of the supreme mind within an arbitrary barrier, or exclude from the limits of veracity any conception of the deity, which, if imperfect and inadequate, may be only a little more so than our own? The name of God, says Hobbes, is used not to make us conceive him, or he is inconceivable, but that we may honor him, believe in God, and adore him, said the Greek poet, but investigate him not. The inquiry is fruitless, seek not to discover who God is, for, by the desire to know, you offend him who chooses to remain unknown, when we attempt, says Philo, to investigate the essence of the absolute being, we fall into an abyss of perplexity, and the only benefit to be derived from such researches is the conviction of their absurdity. Yet man, though ignorant of the constitution of the dust on which he treads, has ventured, and still ventures, to speculate on the nature of God, and to define dogmatically and creeds the subject least within the compass of his faculties, and even to hate and persecute those who will not accept his views as true. But though a knowledge of the divine essence is impossible, the conceptions formed respecting it are interesting, as indications of intellectual development. The history of religion is the history of the human mind and the conception formed by it of deity is always in exact relation to its moral and intellectual attainments. The one is the index and the measure of the other. The negative notion of God, which consists in abstracting the inferior and finite, is, according to Philo, the only way in which it is possible for man worthily to apprehend the nature of God. After exhausting the varieties of symbolism, we contrast the divine greatness with human littleness and employ expressions apparently affirmative, such as, infinite, almighty, all-wise, omnipotent, eternal, and the like, which in reality amount only to denying, in regard to God, those limits which confine the faculties of man, and thus we remain content with a name which is a mere conventional sign and confession of our ignorance. The Hebrew and the Greek too on expressed abstract existence, without outward manifestation or development. Of the same nature are the definitions, God is a sphere whose center is everywhere, and whose circumference nowhere, God is he who sees all, himself unseen, and finally, that of Proclus and Hegel, the two, that which has no outward and positive existence. Most of the so-called ideas or definitions of the abs out are only a collection of negations, from which, as they affirm nothing, nothing is learned. God was first recognized in the heavenly bodies and in the elements. When man's consciousness of his own intellectuality was matured, and he became convinced that the internal faculty of thought was something more subtle than even the most subtle elements, he transferred that new conception to the object of his worship, and deified a mental principle instead of a physical one. He in every case makes God after his own image, for do what we will. The highest efforts of human thought can conceive nothing higher than the supremacy of intellect, and so he ever comes back to some familiar type of exalted humanity. He at first defies nature, and afterward himself. The eternal aspiration of the religious sentiment in man is to become united with God. In his earliest development, the wish and its fulfillment were simultaneous, 
through unquestioning belief. In proportion, as the conception of deity was exalted, the notion of his terrestrial presence or proximity was abandoned and the difficulty of comprehending the divine government, together with the glaring superstitious evils arising out of its misinterpretation, endangered the belief in it altogether. Even the lights of heaven, which, as, bright potentates of the sky, were formerly the vigilant directors of the economy of earth now shine dim and distant, and real no more descends upon a sunbeam. But the real change has been in the progressive ascent of man's own faculties, and not in the divine nature, as the stars are no more distant now than when they were supposed to rest on the shoulders of Atlas. And yet a little sense of disappointment and humiliation attended the first awakening of the soul, when reason, looking upward toward the deity, was impressed with a dizzy sense of having fallen. But hope revives in despondency, and every nation that ever advanced beyond the most elementary conceptions, felt the necessity of an attempt to fill the chasm, real or imaginary, separating man from God. To do this was the great task of poetry philosophy, and religion. Hence the personifications of God's attributes, developments, and manifestations, as, powers, intelligences, angels, emanations, through which and the oracular faculty in himself, man could place himself in communion with God. The various ranks and orders of mythical beings imagined by Persians, Indians, Egyptians, or Etrurians, to preside over the various departments of nature, had each his share in a scheme to bring man into closer approximation to the deity, they eventually gave way only before an analogous though less picturesque symbolism, and the deities and demons of Greece and Rome were perpetuated with only a change of names, when their offices were transferred to saints and martyrs. The attempts by which reason had sometimes endeavored to span the unknown by a bridge of metaphysics, such as the idealistic systems of Zoroaster, Pythagoras, or Plato, were only a more refined form of the poetical illusions which satisfied the vulgar, and man still looked back with longing to the lost golden age, when his ancestors communed face to face with the gods, and hoped that, by propitiating heaven, he might accelerate the renewal of it in the islands of the far west, under the scepter of Kronos, or in a centralization of political power at Jerusalem. His eager hope overcame even the terrors of the grave for the divine power was as infinite as human expectation, and the Egyptian, duly and in the Libyan catacombs, was supposed to be already on his way to the fortunate abodes under the guidance of Hermes, there to obtain a perfect association and reunion with his God. Remembering what we have already said elsewhere in regard to the old ideas concerning the deity, and repeating it as little as possible, let us once more put ourselves in communion with the ancient poetic and philosophic mind, and endeavor to learn of it what it thought, and how it solved the great problems that have ever tortured the human intellect. The division of the first and supreme cause into two parts, one active and the other passive, the universe agent and patient, or the hermaphroditic God world, is one of the most ancient and widespread dogmas of philosophy or natural theology. Almost every ancient people gave it a place in their worship, their mysteries, and their ceremonies. Ocellus Lucanus, who seems to have lived shortly after Pythagoras opened his school in Italy, five or six hundred years before our era, and in the time of Solon, Thales, and the other sages who had studied in the schools of Egypt, not only recognizes the eternity of the universe, and its divine character as an unproduced and indestructible being but also the distinction of active and passive causes in what he terms the grand whole, or the single hermaphroditic being that comprehends all existences, as well causes as effects, and which is a system regularly ordered, perfect and complete, of all natures. He well apprehended the dividing line that separates existence eternally the same, from that which eternally changes, the nature of celestial from that of terrestrial bodies that of causes from that of effects, that which is from that which only becomes common distinction that naturally struck every thinking man. We shall not quote his language at full length. The heavenly bodies, he thought, are first and the most noble, they move of themselves, and ever evolve, without change of form or essence. Fire, 
water, earth, and air change incessantly and continually, not place, but form. Then, as in the universe there are generation and cause of generation, comma, as generation is where there are change and displacement of parts, and cause where there is stability of nature, evidently, it belongs to what is the cause of generation, to move and to act, and to the recipient, to be made and moved. In his view, everything above the moon was the habitation of the gods, all below, that of nature and discord, this operates dissolution of things made, that, production of those that are being made. As the world is unproduced and indestructible, as it had no beginning, and will have no end, necessarily the principle that operates generation in another than itself, and that which operates it in itself, have coexisted. The former is all above the moon, and especially the sun, the latter is the sublunary world. Of these two parts, one active, the other passive one divine and always the same, the other mortal and ever changing, all that we call the world or universe is composed. These accorded with the principles of the Egyptian philosophy, which held that man and the animals had always existed together with the world, that they were its effects, eternal like itself. The chief divisions of nature into active and passive causes, its system of generation and destruction, and the concurrence of the two great principles, heaven and earth, uniting to form all things, will, according to Ocellus, always continue to exist, enough. He concludes, as to the universe, the generations and destructions effected in it, the mode in which it now exists, the mode in which it will ever exist, by the eternal qualities of the two principles, one always moving, the other always moved, one always governing, the other always governed. Such is a brief summary of the doctrine of this philosopher, whose work is one of the most ancient that has survived to us. The subject on which he treated occupied in his time all men's minds, the poets sang of cosmogonies and theogonies, and the philosophers wrote treatises on the birth of the world and the elements of its composition. The cosmogony of the Hebrews, attributed to Moses, that of the Phoenicians, ascribed to Sancho Oniathan, that of the Greeks, composed by Hesiod, that of the Egyptians, the Atlans, and the Cretans, preserved by Diodorus Siculus, the fragments of the theology of Orpheus, divided among different writers, the books of the Persians, or their Bandahish, those of the Hindus, the traditions of the Chinese and the people of Makassar, the cosmogonic chants which Virgil puts in the mouth of Iopas at Carthage, and those of the old Silenus, the first book of the Metamorphoses of Ovid, all testify to the aniquity and universality of these fictions as to the origin of the world and its causes. At the head of the causes of nature, heaven and earth were laced, and the most apparent parts of each, the sun, the moon, the fixed stars and planets, and, above all, the zodiac, among the active causes of generation, and among the passive, the several elements. These causes were not only classed in the progressive order of their energy, heaven and earth heading the respective lists, but distinct sexes were in some sort assigned to them, and characteristics analogous to the mode in which they concur in universal generation. The doctrine of Ocellus was the general doctrine everywhere, it naturally occurring to all to make the same distinction. The Egyptians did so, in selecting those animals in which they recognized these emblematic qualities, in order to symbolize the double sex of the universe. Their god Nef, out of whose mouth issued the Orphic egg, whence the author of the Clementine Recognitions makes a hermaphroditic figure to emerge uniting in itself the two principles whereof heaven and the earth are forms, and which enter into the organization of all beings which the heavens and the earth engender by their concourse, furnishes another emblem of the double power, active and passive, which the ancients saw in the universe, and which they symbolized by the egg. Orpheus, who studied in Egypt, borrowed from the theologians of that country the mysterious forms under which the science of nature was veiled and carried into Greece the symbolic egg, with its division into two parts or causes figured by the hermaphroditic being that issued from it, and whereof heaven and earth are composed. The Brahmins of India expressed the same cosmogonic idea by a statue, representative of the universe, uniting in itself both sexes. 
The male sex offered an image of the sun, center of the active principle, and the female sex that of the moon, at the sphere whereof, proceeding downward, the passive portion of nature begins. The lingam, unto the present day revered in the Indian temples, being but the conjunction of the organs of generation of the two sexes, was an emblem of the same. The Hindus have ever had the greatest veneration for this symbol of ever reproductive nature. The Greeks consecrated the same symbols of universal fruitfulness in their mysteries, and they were exhibited in the sanctuaries of Eleusis. They appear among the sculptured ornaments of all the Indian temples. Tertullian accuses the Valentinians of having adopted the custom of venerating them, a custom, he says, introduced by Melampus from Egypt into Greece. The Egyptians consecrated the phallus in the mysteries of Osiris and Isis, as we learn from Plutarch and Diodorus Siculus, and the latter assures us that these emblems were not consecrated by the Egyptians alone, but by every people. They certainly were so among the Persians and Assyrians, and they were regarded everywhere as symbolic of the generative and productive powers of all animated beings. In those early ages, the works of nature and all her agents were sacred like herself. For the union of nature with herself is a chaste marriage, of which the union of man and woman was a natural image, all their organs were an expressive emblem of the double energy which manifests itself in heaven and earth uniting together to produce all beings, the heavens, says Plutarch, seem to men to fulfill the functions of father, and the earth of mother. The former impregnated the earth with its fertilizing rains, and the earth, receiving them, became fruitful and brought forth. Heaven, which covers and embraces the earth everywhere, is her potent spouse, uniting himself to her to make her fruitful, without which she would languish in everlasting sterility, buried in the shades of chaos and of night. Their union is their marriage their productions or parts are their children. The skies are our father and nature the great mother of us all. This idea was not the dogma of a single sect, but the general opinion of all the sages. Nature was divided, says Cicero, into two parts, one active, and the other that submitted itself to this action, which it received, and which modified it. The former was deemed to be a force, and the latter the material on which that force exerted itself. Macrobius repeated almost literally the doctrine of Ocellus. Aristotle termed the earth a fruitful mother, environed on all sides by the air. Above it was heaven, the dwelling place of the gods and the divine stars, its substance ether, or a fire incessantly moving in circles, divine and incorruptible, and subject to no change. Below it, nature, and the elements, mutable and acted on, corruptible and mortal. Cynthius said that generations were affected in the portions of the universe which we inhabit, while the cause of generations resided in the portions above us, whence descend to us the germs of the effects produced here below. Proclus and Simplicia esteemed heaven the active cause and father, relatively to the earth. The former says that the world or the whole is a single animal, what is done in it, is done by it. The same world acts, and acts upon itself. He divides it into heaven and generation. In the former, he says, are placed and arranged the conservative causes of generation, superintended by the genii and gods. The earth, or Rhea, associated ever with Saturn in production, is mother of the effects of which heaven is father, the womb or bosom that receives the fertilizing energy of the god that engenders ages. The great work of generation is operated, he says primarily by the action of the sun, and secondarily by that of the moon, so that the sun is the primitive source of this energy, as father and chief of the male gods that form his court. He follows the action of the male and female principles through all the portions and divisions of nature, attributing to the former the origin of stability and identity, to the latter, that of diversity and mobility. Heaven is to the earth, he says, as the male to the female. It is the movement of the heavens that, by their revolutions, furnished the seminal incitements and forces, whose emanations received by the earth, make it fruitful, and cause it to produce animals and plants of every kind. Philo says that Moses recognized this doctrine of two causes, active and passive. 
but made the former to reside in the mind or intelligence external to matter. The ancient astrologers divided the twelve signs of the zodiac into six male and six female, and assigned them to six male or six female gods. Heaven and earth, or Auranos and Ga, were among the most ancient nations, the first and the most ancient divinities. We find them in the Phoenician history of St. Joniathan, and in the Grecian genealogy of the gods given by Hesiod. Everywhere they marry, and by their union produce the later gods, in the beginning. Says Apollodorus, Aranos or the heavens was lord of all the universe. He took to wife Ge or the earth, and had by her many children. They were the first gods of the Cretans, and under other names, of the Armenians, as we learn from Brosus and of Panchea, an island south of Arabia, as we learn from Euemerus. Orpheus made the divinity or the great whole, male and female, because, he said, it could produce nothing, unless it united in itself the productive force of both sexes. He called heaven Panjanita, the father of all things, most ancient of beings, beginning and end of all, containing in himself the incorruptible and unwearying force of necessity. The same idea obtained in the rude north of Europe. The Scythians made the earth to be the wife of Jupiter, and the Germans adored her under the name of Hata. The Celts worshipped the heavens and the earth, and said that without the former the latter would be sterile, and that their marriage produced all things. The Scandinavians acknowledged Bor or the heavens, and gave Ferta, his son, the earth, as his wife. Olos Rudbeck adds, that their ancestors were persuaded that heaven intermarried with the earth, and thus uniting his forces with hers, produced animals and plants. This marriage of heaven and earth produced the Aziz, genii famous in the theology of the north. In the theology of the Phrygians and Lydians, the Asi were born of the marriage of the supreme god with the earth, and Firmicus informs us that the Phrygians attributed to the earth supremacy over the other elements and considered her the great mother of all things. Virgil sings the impregnation of the joyous earth, by the ether, its spouse, that descends upon its bosom, fertilizing it with rains. Golumula sings the loves of nature and her marriage with heaven annually consummated at the sweet springtime. He describes the spirit of life, the soul that animates the world, fired with passion of love, uniting with nature and itself itself a part of nature, and filling its own bosom with new productions. This union of the universe with itself, this mutual action of two sexes, he terms, the great secrets of nature, the mysteries of the union of heaven with earth, imaged in the sacred mysteries of Atis and Bacchus. Varro tells us that the great divinities adored at Samothrace were the heavens and the earth, considered as first causes or primal gods and as male and female agents, one bearing to the other the relations that the soul and principle of movement bear to the body or the matter that receives them. These were the gods revered in the mysteries of that island, as they were in the orgies of Phoenicia. Everywhere the sacred body of nature was covered with the veil of allegory, which concealed it from the profane, and allowed it to be seen only by the sage who thought it worthy to be the object of his study and investigation. She showed herself to those only who loved her in spirit and in truth, and she abandoned the indifferent and careless to error and to ignorance. The sages of Greece, says Pausanias, never wrote otherwise than in an enigmatical manner, never naturally and directly. Nature, says Salas the philosopher, should be sung only in a language that imitates the secrecy of her processes and operations. She is herself an enigma. We see only bodies in movement. The forces and springs that move them are hidden from us. The poets inspired by the divinity, the wisest philosophers, all the theologians, the chiefs of the initiations and mysteries, even the gods uttering their oracles, have borrowed the figurative language of allegory. The Egyptians, says Proclus, preferred that mode of teaching, and spoke of the great secrets of nature, only in mythological enigmas. The gymnosophists of India and the druids of Gaul lent to science the same enigmatic language, and in the same style wrote the Hierophants of Phoenicia. The division of things into the active and the passive cause leads to that of the two principles of light and darkness, connected with and corresponding with it. 
for light comes from the ethereal substance that composes the active cause, and darkness from earth or the gross matter which composes the passive cause. In Hesiod, the earth, by its union with Tartarus, engenders Typhon, chief of the powers or genii of darkness. Put it unites itself with the ether or Auranos, when it engenders the gods of Olympus, or the stars, children of starry Auranos. Light was the first divinity worshipped by men. To it they owed the brilliant spectacle of nature. It seems an emanation from the creator of all things, making known to our senses the universe which darkness hides from our eyes, and, as it were giving it existence. Darkness, as it were, reduces all nature again to nothingness, and almost entirely annihilates man. Naturally, therefore, two substances of opposite natures were imagined, to each of which the world was in turn subjected, one contributing to its felicity and the other to its misfortune. Light multiplied its enjoyments, darkness despoiled it of them, the former was its friend, the latter its enemy. To one all good was attributed, to the other all evil, and thus the words light and good became synonymous, and the words darkness and evil. It seeming that good and evil could not flow from one and the same source, any more than could light and darkness, men naturally imagined two causes or principles, of different natures and opposite in their effects, one of which shed light and good, and the other darkness and evil, on the universe. This distinction of the two principles was admitted in all the theologies, and formed one of the principal bases of all religions. It entered as a primary element into the sacred fables, the cosmogonies and the mysteries of antiquity. We are not to suppose, says Plutarch, that the principles of the universe are inanimate bodies, as Democritus and Epicurus thought, nor that a matter devoid of qualities is organized and arranged by a single reason or providence, sovereign over all things, as the Stoics held, for it is not possible that a single being, good or evil, is the cause of all inasmuch as God can in no wise be the cause of any evil. The harmony of the universe is a combination of contraries, like the strings of a lyre, or that of a bow, which alternately is stretched and relaxed, the good, says Euripides, is never separated from the evil. The two must mingle, that all may go well. And this opinion as to the two principles, continues Plutarch, is that of all antiquity. From the theologians and legislators it passed to the poets and philosophers. Its author is unknown, but the opinion itself is established by the traditions of the whole human race, and consecrated in the mysteries and sacrifices both of the Greeks and barbarians, wherein was recognized the dogma of opposing principles in nature, which, by their contrariety, produce the mixture of good and evil. We must admit two contrary causes, two opposing powers, which lead, one to the right and the other to the left, and thus control our life, as they do the sublunary world, which is therefore subject to so many changes and irregularities of every kind. For if there can be no effect without a cause, and if the good cannot be the cause of the evil, it is absolutely necessary that there should be a cause for the evil, as there is one for the good. This doctrine, he adds, has been generally received among most nations and especially by those who have had the greatest reputation for wisdom. All have admitted to gods, with different occupations, one making the good and the other the evil found in nature. The former has been styled, God, the latter, Demon. The Persians, or Zoroaster, named the former Ormitzd and the latter Araman, of whom they said one was of the nature of light, the other of that of darkness. The Egyptians called the former Osiris and the latter Typhon, his eternal enemy. The Hebrews, at least after their return from the Persian captivity, had their good deity, and the devil, a bad and malicious spirit, ever opposing God, and chief of the angels of darkness, as God was of those of light. The word Satan means, in Hebrew, simply, the adversary. The Tudines, Plutarch says, had their good and evil stars. The Greeks had their Jupiter and Pluto and their giants and titans, to whom were assigned the attributes of the serpent with which Pluto or Serapis was encircled, and the shape whereof was assumed by Typhon, Araman, and the Satan of the Hebrews. Every people had something equivalent to this. 
The people of Pegya believe in two principles, one author of good and the other of evil, and strive to propitiate the latter, while they think it needless to worship the former, as he is incapable of doing evil. The people of Java, of the Malakas, of the Gold Coast, the Hottentots, the people of Tenerife and Madagascar, and the savage tribes of America, all worship and strive to avert the anger and propitiate the goodwill of the evil spirit. But among the Greeks, Egyptians, Chaldeans, Persians, and Assyrians, the doctrine of the two principles formed a complete and regularly arranged theological system. It was the basis of the religion of the Magi and of Egypt. The author of an ancient work, attributed to Origen, says that Pythagoras learned from Zarishta, a Magus at Babylon, the same, perhaps, as Zerdusht or Zoroaster, that there are two principles of all things whereof one is the father and the other the mother, the former, light, and the latter, darkness. Pythagoras thought that the dependencies on light were warmth, dryness, lightness, swiftness, and those on darkness, cold, wet, weight, and slowness, and that the world derived its existence from these two principles, as from the male and the female. According to Porphyry, he conceived two opposing powers, one good, which he termed unity, the light, right, the equal, the stable, the straight, the other evil, which he termed binary, darkness, the left, the unequal, the crooked. These ideas he received from the Orientals, for he dwelt twelve years at Babylon, studying with the Magi. Varro says he recognized two principles of all things, the finite and the infinite, good and evil, life and death, day and night. White he thought was of the nature of the good principle, and black of that of the evil, that light and darkness, heat and cold, the dry and the wet, mingled in equal proportions, that summer was the triumph of heat, and winter of cold, that their equal combination produced spring and autumn, the former producing verdure and favorable to health, and the 